Karl Barth was a towering Christian theologian of the uh, uh, middle of last century. I heard him speak in Chicago when I was a seminarian, not too many years before Karl Barth died. Barth was born in Switzerland, in the German part of Switzerland, and he was the stereotypical German professor. He wrote a number of theological books, required reading for many of us, heavy, ponderous tomes, thick and wordy and dense. There was never a simple theological answer for Karl Barth. It took long involved sentences in long involved paragraphs to confront any of the huge questions of faith. For Karl Barth, it was complicated being a Christian, to be a follower of this Jesus of Nazareth, and so trying to explain Jesus would of course be complicated. All the more surprising then that toward the end of his life, Bart was asked to condense the Christian faith into its simplest form. And that was something that he had been reluctant to do all of his professional life. After just a moment's hesitation, he said, the Christian faith can be summed up in the words of that old children's song, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Put aside all those longer, theologically dense creeds and statements of faith, many of which were created in the first place to decide who was in and who was out, who was a firm believer, a true believer, and those who were obviously not. Stripped of all of its complexities, this is the faith that has taken hold of us fully as much as we have taken hold of it. Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. I think that the Apostle Paul, first century Christian missionary, had many German characteristics. He, like Karl Barth, likes to express himself in long, involved, rambling, run-on Greek sentences, some of which are an entire paragraph in length. As we as seminary students were translating uh, the scriptures from Greek into English, we said, uh, Bart used a whole lot, I mean that Paul used a whole lot of commas and he could have used a lot more periods to make it easier for us. In his letter to the Romans, Paul tries his best to articulate his understanding of God coming to us in Jesus Christ. If you look at that whole letter to the Romans, it's 16 chapters long, that was Paul's attempt to state as clearly as he could why Paul, who was born a Jew and became an ardent Pharisee, had now become this ardent admirer and advocate for Jesus of Nazareth. The first 11 chapters of Romans are his reasoned theology. How Jesus really is the fulfillment of those Hebrew aspirations that we call the Old Testament. And in the midst of this long, involved discourse, discourse, Paul has this key thought in chapter 5. But God's grace, God's grace is much greater, and so is his free gift to so many people through the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ. And there's a difference between God's gift and the sin of the one person, for after the one sin, Adam and Eve in the garden, came the judgment of guilty. But after so many sins, comes the undeserved gift of not 
guilty. And so, friends, the verdict is in. That although you and I are deemed to be guilty, guilty of not loving God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, not really and not daily, and although we are deemed to be guilty, guilty of not loving the neighbor, <coughs> certainly guilty of defining the neighbor so narrowly that the neighbor always looks just like us, when the neighbor really is all of God's children. <coughs> although we are deemed to be guilty, guilty of not loving ourselves, not with a healthy love, that daily proclaims we are indeed the children of God, God's own beloved ones. Although guilty of all that, when the verdict comes down, instead of being rightly judged as guilty, the balance of justice is swayed in our favor, and we hear the verdict, and it is not. Guilty. It's not as if we have hoodwinked the judge. It's not as if we have withheld evidence of wrongdoing. It's not that we have uh, compromised some of the witnesses. It's not that because we have hidden behind some obscure idiosyncrasy of the law. The God of Jesus Christ knows you and me through and through. The judge, so to speak, sees even into the very interior of our lives. And God knows we are guilty. Guilty of all that we have been accused of and much more. And yet with a look of compassion, this God declares you and me to be not guilty. We're off the hook. We are redeemed and saved and caught up in God's love. And that, friends, is the good news of the gospel. The God who knows we are guilty of so much and so often has chosen in Jesus Christ to forgive and forget. We're free. Free. See, there's so much about us that is cheap and tawdry and unlovable that only a parent could love us. And that is exactly it. The parent God loves us. The God who has given us life, that parent, may wring hands in obvious concern over us, may sit up late awaiting our return again, Maybe looking down the road every day, hoping that will be the day that we will come to our senses. The day when we more fully understand our status as being the beloved ones of a gracious, forgiving God. Who's always saying, come on home. There's room at the table. We were expecting you. Glad you're So God is the firm believer in the great homecoming. The great homecoming when the lost are found. The great homecoming when the lonely are reunited. When the abused are healed. When the forgotten are lifted up again. When the arrogant are reconciled with the have-nots. When those deprived of justice receive justice. And when all are wrapped up in God's homecoming love. The parent God declares all are forgiven. That's all of us. All are redeemed. All are not guilty. All saved by God's grace and God's love. Jesus loves me, this I know, 
for the Bible tells me so. As we gather about the table of grace, know that God loves you no matter what. Know that God welcomes all of us home over and over again. And we live in that promise for as long as we are here. Amen.